Hello, another episode of In Conservation With, and I'm very excited as ever, but maybe more so tonight because we're talking about a subject which I think a lot of people think about, perhaps most of the world thinks, thinks about, and it's uh, about a group of creatures who are so misunderstood, it's untrue. And I'm hoping that after tonight, we'll have a much clearer view and we'll be out there campaigning for their safety and to change their, their persona, the public persona that they, that they have at the moment. This is on In Conservation with I'm David Lindo, sponsored by the Deputation de Cathras, which is the tourism board that looks after the northern part of Extremadura in uh, southwest Spain and also Leica Sport Optics. So thank you guys for, for getting this and making this all happen. And my guest tonight is Sarah Fowler. Um, she is a marine biologist and she has a whole slew of accolades, which I won't even, I mean, maybe she can tell you about that stuff because I'm sure that she will be, <laughs> <laughs> she will be um, telling us about her, her work. But I mean, I can quickly give you a rundown as to what she, um, what she does. Um, once my, yeah, what she does because she, uh, well, basically she has had a lifetime, I suppose, love for the sea, haven't you? And you, you, uh, you love sharks. You've been loving sharks for a long time. But anyway, you'll be telling us all about that in your short presentation, won't you? I will. Yes. Good. And by the way, how are you, Sarah? I think I'm not even spoken to you. How are you, Sarah? And where are you? I'm sitting at home in Plymouth, where I have been since the 1st of March last year. And I have never been in one place for so long ever in my life. And I love it. I just love it. I love being at home. But unfortunately, I'm going to have to start traveling again soon. Um, and with any luck, traveling won't just mean being in windowless meeting rooms, but it'll also mean getting out into the field and, and seeing some sharks, I hope. And when you say traveling, are you, um, what kind of traveling are you talking about? Is, is it all on sea or do you actually, uh, you know, where are you? Well, actually, um, I mentioned windowless meeting rooms and that's normally where I am, sadly, because um, as so often happens, I got away from being a marine biologist and getting my feet, in fact, not just getting my feet wet, but totally immersed in the sea. And I do more and more policy work now. So I, I do a lot of work on the conservation on in, um, Convention on International Trade and Endangered Species and the Convention for the Conservation of Migratory Species, trying to get sharks conserved and managed by all the countries in the world that have them in their waters or which trade in their products. So it's all yeah, policy. You got, uh, policy. Yeah, you've got a very distinguished um, CV here. I mean, as you say, you acted as deputy chair, acting chair and co-chair of the IUCN's shark specialist group for 18 years, um, including heading the first global, what is that word? Chondri... Oh, chondrichthians. Yeah. Just call them sharks, David. I'll explain. Okay, that'll do me. I Shark can't pronounce it either. <laughs> It's almost as bad as when um, watching um, Trump trying to pronounce, uh, what's that um, drug that he was trying to push the chlorodiagloricline or something. It's the same kind of thing. Mm. Um, but anyway, very distinguished. I'm sure you'll be telling us about that, as I said earlier. But, you know, it's interesting with sharks because they have had such bad publicity. And I remember being on a flight a few years ago and seeing a film in which in fact, I didn't actually watch it. I was looking over someone's shoulder. I was watching another film, my own film, but the, uh, the film on the person in front of me is also quite interesting. And without hearing the sound, I can still see what was going on. And basically, she was classically shipwrecked, uh, ended up on some kind of buoy floating just in the harbour of, well, not even harbour, in the bay of some island or bit of landmass. But she thought she could just jump in the sea and go for a swim to the shore, which she tried to do. But then all of a sudden the shark appeared and then she managed to scramble back. And I think she was with someone else. That person got eaten. So she was then marooned. And this shark was just basically circling around for the whole film. And 
I was thinking, God, this is actually how people think of sharks. And here I am, you know, I'm a naturalist. I, you know, love nature. And I, I like to think that I've got a balanced view on things. And I was thinking, I was rooting for her. What's going on? Have I been brainwashed? Yeah, we all have. I mean, we all have. And um, with me, um, I will never forget going to see the film Jaws when it first came out in the late 70s. And it's still one of the greatest um, sort of horror biology type films. You know, it's, it's fabulous. Nothing's ever come close. It's a brilliant, brilliant film. And Peter Benchley, who wrote the original book, never got over the fact that his film was responsible for um, encouraging people to go out and kill sharks and for making people terrified of sharks. I've been to little, a little village, I remember once in Borneo, where there was no electricity, chatting to the fishermen. And they had, all of them had seen the film Jaws somewhere. And they were all frightened of sharks. And I said, well, has anyone in the village ever been bitten by a shark or been chased by a shark? Oh, no, no, no. They, they saw sharks every day. They caught them you know, for a living, but they were all frightened of sharks because of jaws, not for any other reason, not because of their experience. But you say a brilliant film, but obviously it's not that brilliant because it's, it's, tied, it's, it's, it's tainted a whole, well, several generations. I mean, everyone since that film's been made yeah. has now you know, got this innate fear of sharks. Yes, it's um, when, when is too much publicity, bad publicity. Uh, you think of the um, Jurassic Park films. I mean, they were really frightened, frightening, of course, but everyone loves dinosaurs. Perhaps it's different because they are very much extinct. But I think in some respects, Jaws was useful in drawing to everyone's attention. The fact that there are these amazing animals out there, even if there's only one white shark and, and most sharks are, well, I'll, I'll talk about it later, but most sharks are just not like that. There are maybe five species of sharks in the world that are dangerous to people, and most of those are critically endangered. There are not many of them yeah. left. Funny, you mentioned Jurassic Park. I remember taking my, my nephew to see that film, and he was maybe six, and there was a scene when uh, they're inside some kind of uh, a lab or kitchen or something, and there's this, this small velociraptors running around and he was so scared, this boy, my, my nephew, he ran screaming from the cinema oh, and I had no. to run after him. He was like, no, they're in, they're in there, they're in there. And then you had to run out. So it was quite, <laughs> it was quite well, um, funny yeah. to see that. Anyway. At least um, you know sharks and it aren't going to chase you out of the water. Exactly. Um, okay, well, listen, we're in a position where we can um, share my screen and show the presentation that, um, is, is that okay if we start your presentation? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so please excuse my tiny desktop, um, but, uh, okay, this should work. Can everyone, can you see this? I can certainly see it. Well, I'm sure everyone else can, and if they can't, then please put your, your hand up. Um, and the best way to view this, by the way, is if you go to gallery, um, so I go to the view section and, and put in speaker view, then you'll have the whole of the presentation as one um, vision as opposed to seeing it as a tiny box. So Sarah, over to you and let me know when you want to, to turn it to the next page. Thanks very much. Well, we had to have a white shark because we've just been talking about them and we always do. And this is a photo by a very good friend of mine, Michael Scholl, taken in South Africa with a white shark just coming and checking out a guy in a kayak and they're very inquisitive and they're very smart but you know they're looking for seals in South Africa and seals aren't bright yellow with paddles and sharks know that but the question why sharks I'm, I'm looking at this from several points of view why did I ever get into sharks why are sharks important why are sharks interesting why should everyone adore sharks so my next screen really starts with um, how I got into sharks David and it goes right back to my childhood. And there I am, very short, looking rather damp, um, in the days when I had red hair. And if you click a couple more, um, I'm showing you this because this is the beach where it all started for me. 
And top right hand corner, I was born with that sort of resting bitch face. But, you know, there I was on a beach. And the next slide shows the boat that my father and I used to go out in when we went out fishing. And, and we had a little tiny gill net. And there's a diagram of the gill net below, which we used to set just offshore overnight. And we'd go back in the morning and there'd be a tiny handful of, I don't know, mullet, mackerel, whiting, something like that, which would be nice for breakfast. One day we went out though, and, and the next one shows a taupe shark. Um, it also shows a basking shark, I'm, my timing's wrong. And one day our net had been occupied by a taupe shark, which is the one at the bottom, and it had rolled itself up completely like a cigar. It was desperately sad. My father and I, well, I say we rode back to the beach. He did all the work. He rode back to the beach and I sat in this tiny little boat with the taupe shark's head and open mouth inches from my bare toes. And we got back to the shore and we, we eventually unrolled it, but by then it was dead. And, and we were both really, really upset by that dead shark. It was, it was a tragedy. And uh, I tried very hard with my little seashore guide to identify it and I just couldn't. That was my first shark, my first shark ever. And the sh second shark was a couple of years later, it was a basking shark. Again, I went out for a walk with my father this time in Cornwall, early one morning before breakfast. And there was a basking shark going round and round and round in the water, um, just down the coast. And I was sort of hooked on sharks. So the next one is, that is what happened. I became a marine ecologist. I worked for the UK government. I did everything marine in the UK, not particularly sharks and rays, a little bit of that. But next slide, after I left the UK, I had a little coffee morning rant one day with a colleague of mine. Oh, sharks are in so much trouble. Nobody's paying attention. No, somebody really needs to do something about it. And as a result of that conversation, next one, I found myself in the IUCN shark specialist group. My colleague said to IUCN, we've got someone here who will help set up a shark specialist group. You clearly need one, she'll help you do it. And that is when I began the long process of becoming a shark specialist. It was just in cautious talk. Loose lips can change your career. So moving on to what sharks actually are. And the next one, please. They're, they're cartilaginous fisheries and chondric these just basically means cartilaginous fish and nobody can spell or pronounce chondrichthian so we just call them sharks for, for shorthand but they're actually sharks and skates and rays and chimeras all the cartilaginous fishes and the next um this is not a shark this is a cod it's a bony fish and all of you have i have I expect at some stage you've eaten bony fish and you know they're full of sharp bones. Um, whereas the next slide shows the skeleton of a spiny dogfish, which is a shark. And you can see there's a whole lot of stuff missing there. It's basically a cranium at one end, a tail at the other end, and um, a, spinal a spinal column connecting them all together, and virtually nothing else apart from the fins. They're incredibly flexible. They're fairly light because they don't have heavy bones, but they don't have a um, swim bladder. So they do tend to sit, uh, sink and you find a lot of sharks lying around on the bottom. Um, another thing that's really characteristic of sharks and the next one is their teeth. Oh, sorry. Um, something went, yeah, carry on David, please. Um, and then the next one, this is, it's probably quite hard to see, but what we're looking at here is an evolutionary tree of the fishes. And the group on the right-hand side, which I've outlined in red, those are the bony fishes. And the next one shows the point where the bony fishes and the cartilaginous fishes diverged um, in geological time. It was well over 400 million years ago. So while sharks, and bony fishes are both fishes, they have really no close relationship to each other at all. Sharks are far more closely related, for example, to frogs than they are to bony fishes. 
And the next one, since we're looking at geological time here with the current, um, you know, to modern day at the top and the Cambrian at the bottom, I've just highlighted the Jurassic Triassic period, which of course is Jurassic Park is the dinosaurs. So sharks and bony fishes evolved long, long before there were any four legged creatures, long before there were even any insects on land. So the next one. Um, what is a shark? It's got these pairs of gill openings on each side of the head. And if you can show, click over to the picture, oops, it disappeared, never mind. Um, you, they have these paired gill openings. So most sharks have five on each side of the head, whereas a bony fish, of course, just has um, a plate covering the gills. Uh, rays also have this sort of same five to six um, pairs of gills on each side of the head and the chimeras have them too but the chimeras have a, a flap over them so you can't see them so well and the next one the next slide it's got they've got these incredibly hard teeth and in fact the scales on the outside of the body are basically like teeth they're the same structures um, next one and they come in all shapes and forms and they are really, really long lived in the fossil record. So um, it's possible to look at pretty well any, any sedimentary rock and sooner or later you'll find shark's teeth in there because they drop out constantly throughout the life of the animal and they're just floating down to the bottom of the sea or the bottom of the lake or river and um, accumulating there in the, the fossil record. And some of them are really bizarre. The other interesting thing about shark's teeth is that they, change with age in some species. So for example, in the mako shark, a small mako is mainly grabbing small fish and squid. So it's got really spiky, pointy teeth that it can use to grab small slippery creatures and, and swallow them whole. But when makos get really, really large, they start looking for larger prey and their teeth become similar to the white shark's teeth. They have these sort of triangular teeth, which they can use to chop chunks out of, of um, large prey with. Many sharks just live off um, seashells, mollusks or, or crustacea like crabs. And then they don't have sharp teeth. They just have sort of pavements of teeth, which they can use to grind up their prey. And then the next slide shows, um, one of my favorite species. It's, it's one of the most primitive sharks, and I'm afraid that's not a very useful photo. That's, that's Dave Ebert, one of my colleagues, with a frilled shark, which has the most extraordinary spiky, spiky, spiky teeth. And this is a very, very primitive shark species. Really fascinating one. And the next. And keep going. So, because they've been around such a very long time, they've had 400 million years to diversify into all sorts of different forms. And I'm talking about sharks, but I often use shark as, as a shorthand for all of the cartilaginous fishes, the skates, the rays, the sawfishes, which are actually a form of ray, but they have this incredibly long um, rostrum and nose that looks like a hedge trimmer. The guitar fishes, which look a bit like sharks, um, even though they're rays, and then the angel shark, which looks like a ray because it's flat, and of course the chimeras. So next one, please. Um, despite 400 year, million years of evolution, most sharks are extinct. There have been some massive, massive extinction events, and the golden age of sharks was a long time ago. Now we only know of, of about 1,200 species of shark skates and rays, and about half of those are sharks. Um, slightly more are rays, and there's only a handful of chimeras. So we're still talking about um, about 550 species of sharks. And uh, the numbers, the rate at which new shark species are being described is, is phenomenal. There are new species appearing every month and being described and named by scientists. So it's really hard to catch up. Next one. Um, th this is actually just a little plug for some of the Princeton Press books. Um, and I mainly put that in because you can see 
this red and white speckled creature, which is a chimera. And everyone knows what sharks look like. Everyone knows a ray or a manta ray or escape, but the chimeras are these very, very strange animals, which, which we don't really pay nearly enough attention to. They're sometimes called rabbit fish or ghost sharks or spook fishes, and they're very cool, but that's it. I, I, we don't have time to talk about them. Um, next one, please. So what is a shark? Well, this is a classic hammerhead shark, one of the big species, um, one of the really well-known species, except that there are quite a few hammerhead sharks. There are several species, and, and at least one of the species we know of is actually impossible to tell, um, to distinguish by sight. It's only known from its genetics. So we've got some really complicated issues here with trying to identify species, to manage them, um, it's, it's just a bit of a mess. But uh, the hammerhead and the other big sharks, like the white shark, the basking shark, the whale shark, these are not your standard run-of-the-mill sharks because most sharks aren't like that. Could I have the next one, please? Most sharks are actually very, very small. And we, we talked about, um, Peter, uh, David Benchley, sorry, David Benchley, um, Benchley at the, at the beginning of this talk, who never really recovered from um, being responsible for the film Jaws. And I'm sure the uh, graphic on the, the left there, you'll recognize that as a sort of rip off of the original Jaws movie poster. And it's the little lantern shark called Eptmopterus Benchleyi. And uh, there are lots of photos of it there. It's called the ninja lantern shark because it's dark and it's sort of stealthy and it sneaks around in the deep dark ocean. Um, it looks very alarming there, but if, if you could show the next slide, you'll see my colleague, David, with Etmoptuus benchlii, holding it between his finger and thumb. Most sharks are less than a meter long. If they live in the bottom of the sea, they're probably black or close to black, although they'll have all sorts of amazing um, light organs, which enable them to flash and signal. Um, the ones that live in shallow water are incredibly brightly colored. Um, they're not the sort of battleship gray that most of the large sharks are. So the next slide is a very bad photo I just took out of the book. It's a, it's a photo by Andy Murch. So it's a photograph of a photograph and it's of the Puffadder shy shark from South Africa. And that's a typical shark. It's small. It lives in shallow water. It has a very, very restricted range. It doesn't swim all over the world. I can probably swim better than it can. And that's not saying much. And it's really, really brightly colored. Sharks are small and shiny and brightly colored. And often they can't swim very well. And Often we don't know what their names are. Could I have the next? Oh, yeah, just going back to this. Oh, sorry, going back. Don't worry to turn it back. Um, a colleague of mine did his PhD on, on some of these small sharks in South Africa, and he discovered new species just by looking at what was thought to be a single common species of shark. And Dave Ebert is very irritating like that. Every time he, he goes and dives into a university, uh, university or museum collection of sharks, he comes out with new species. We call him Lost Shark Guy because he's always finding new sharks. Um, and the next one, please. So they're small, they're colorful. They live on the seabed. They don't swim very fast. They're either in very, very shallow water or they're in very, very deep water. And the next. Um, the ones that swim around in the open ocean, like the um, basking shark, the white shark, mako shark, and those hammerheads, they're actually the unusual ones. Um, but they are the species which are caught in huge quantities in, in oceanic fisheries. They are the ones which have big fins and are therefore particularly important in the fin trade. They have lots of meat, lots of them are delicious. So they're also very important in the meat trade. And they tend to receive all of the attention, but they're not necessarily the most threatened species. And the next one. Now, 
I really became interested in sharks because they pose such a difficult issue, that such a conundrum. Environmentalists, conservationists say, these are wildlife. You have ecotourism operations for shark. They're wildlife, they're wildlife. They have ecosystem roles. They're, you know, they're, they're keystone species. But because they're also commercially fished, they are fishery species. But because they're only something like 1% of the world's fisheries, they're just not sufficiently important to be a high priority for attention by fisheries managers and policymakers. They're falling between the stools. And so all the decades I've spent working on sharks, it's trying to, to get environment and fisheries just a little bit more joined up so that sharks aren't falling into the gaps between them. And the next one, please. However, <laughs> you can see I'm really pretty hopeless at this because sharks are the world's se second most threatened group of vertebrates after the frogs and the newts and, and what have you. They are the second most threatened group. This donut diagram shows you the traffic light from critically endangered to endangered to vulnerable to near threatened. Only about a third of them are least concern. Um, this graphic's already changed because we've got a lot more conservation assessment since then, but they're under a lot of pressure and yet they're not getting that attention. So I, I'd now like to move on to identification guides and I'll tell you a story about identification guides. I've already said once that if you don't have an identification guide, you can't manage a species. Birders know that, of course. You know, you, you know what the species is, you know where it lives, you know um, whether the population's increasing, decreasing. Birders are fantastic at identifying species. Very, very few people can identify sharks. And most fisheries managers and people monitoring landings are just identifying sharks and rays as sharks and rays, putting them in a bin. We don't know what they are. When I started out working on sharks, this was the only species catalog we had, the only identification guide. Now, next one, please. I went on holiday many years ago to Borneo. And uh, I went to a couple of fish markets, which were fascinating. And um, I talked to some fishermen and it turned out that they were finding sharks way up the rivers in Borneo. And I thought, wow, we've got a, we know that there's a, a missing species, a river shark, which was described in the 19th century, has never been seen again. Maybe they're seeing river sharks. So I, I was very fortunate to get a grant from the UK government to look at all of the sharks and rays in the Malaysian state of Sabah in Borneo. And we used to go to fish markets like this and pick up a few species. Well, the very first time we, we started work on our Darwin project, a colleague and I nipped out to a little fish market and we picked up a couple of small sharks to practice identifying them while the rest of the team turned up. And we couldn't, we couldn't identify them. We could not key them out. I was in despair. I got all of this money from the UK government. We were going to run a project and I was such a numpty. I couldn't key out the first shark we picked up in the first fish market, you know, species zero. Anyway, next one, please. Um, it was all a bit upsetting and here I was with the FAO catalog and it wasn't in the catalog. Uh, a couple of days later, the author of that catalog came along, looked at the shark and said, hmm, new species. And next one. We couldn't find it because it hadn't been published and now it appears it's, it's now in the identification guides. It was described, oh, nearly 10 years after we first found it. So next one. Next one, please, David. So you need these identification guides um, because otherwise we can't conserve these fascinating and brilliant animals and we really do need to to conserve them. Um, another thing I learned, and which still happens today, if I could have the next one, please, is that actually, not only are scientists like Dave Ebert constantly finding new species, members of the public can too. I mean, I was pretty well a member of the public when I first found those um, little mustelers that we couldn't key out. Um, so 
if you've got a good guide and if you've got fantastic illustrations like um, ones that Mark Dando produces for us, and this is Mark in the photo, um, we actually have the ability for fisheries managers and conservationists to identify sharks, to find out where they live, to decide whether they are important fisheries species for local communities or whether they're actually really, um, really rare and need to, be um, need to be conserved. And it was Mark who got me actually into producing the latest guide. He came up to me one day at a meeting and said, you know, we need to do a guide to sharks and rays of the world. And I said, ah, you know, can't do that. But you know, he carried on and he persuaded me. It was a good idea. And so the almost the last slide is last clip is that I have discovered that books are not just amazing to, to read and to look at and to keep on your shelves and to thumb through, but they're actually amazingly fun to produce, particularly when you've got fantastic illustrators and collaborators working with you. That's the end. Thank you, David. Thank you. Let me just see if I can uh, stop share. Great. Thank you very much for that. Very fascinating. And it's interesting to learn that um, the shark that we know of, the, the white shark, I suppose, we think is a classic shark and apparently not. It's not the classic shark. Um, I've been thumbing through your book um, and that's part of the reason why I had to have you on. And it's no... Uh, <laughs> It's no pamphlet, guys. It is actually a bit of a tome. What I have noticed is, as you said, the variety, even though it's based on the same, the kind of original blueprint in terms of the design of the shark, I mean, obviously there's fluctuations with the rays and what have you. I was quite astonished to, you know, look through a book and see things like black dogfish, which looks quite otherworldly, you know, dark, as you said, as it's a bottom feeder, I suppose, with really, big bug eyes and the lantern sharks look weird as well. And I, I just made a note of a few of the fish that st stuck out, stuck out to me, the bullhead sharks, which look, as you said, a bit like, well, for me, like guppies or groupers. And then the weirdest one I came across so far was the, uh, the goblin, the goblin shark, yeah. which is really strange. I mean, can you explain that to, to us for, for those who don't know what the goblin shark is? Cause I didn't know until five minutes ago, personally. Well, for a start, it's pink. It is a pink shark. I mean, sharks come in all colors. Some sharks sort of look a bit like my jumper, the sort of stripy zebra sharks. But the goblin shark is pink. Um, for a long time, it was known only from a few specimens, but now it's actually been caught on underwater camera. It's got a weird head and it has the ability because um, as you saw from the illustrations of the shark, you know, with a sort of, not many bones or not many bits of cartilage and not really tied together. A goblin shark can actually throw its jaws out away from its head to catch fish that are at, thought they were out of reach. It's a bit like the alien in the film, you know, the film alien, which can throw out its jaws. Well, that's what goblin sharks do. And they live in quite deep water and they're sort of pretty flabby and un un unappealing. Although I know people who just think goblin sharks are the best thing in the world, but they're weird. Yeah, they're just so weird. There are many weird sharks. There are sharks. I think that Ridley Scott. Yes. Sorry, go on. Oh no, I think you're right about Ridley Scott. I, he must have seen a goblin shark. Yeah, I'm just thinking because you know even the other sharks, the traditional sharks in very commas. I mean, they they seem to have a protruding, or at least they can draw their sort of lips back to show. Mm -hmm. To bear these 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 uh, these fangs, but as you say, they're an ancient family. Um, they've been around for a heck of a long time. What is the future for the sharks in our world? Oh my! Um, well, it's it's not looking good, but we're working as hard as we can to to turn things around. Um, sharks have survived some massive massive extinction events caused by slow climate change and volcanic eruptions and meteors and all of that stuff. A few of them always get through. So we may be heading into a big Anthropocene um, extinction, but some of the sharks will get by. The, the ones in the bottom of the sea, you know, in the deep, deep ocean, they'll get by and, and um, sharks take their time, you know, 
what's a few hundred million years to the lineage of sharks? Um, they'll get by, but what I really want is for people, future generations to have the chance I have had, for example, to see a white shark come right up to the cage you're standing in and sort of grab, grab the bars and shake it, to be able to go out and swim with whale sharks or with basking sharks. You know, I really want people to have all of those opportunities that I've had and a lot more that I haven't been able to have. You know, I'd, um, I would just want sharks to continue to be there for future generations, not just because they're amazing to look at and to watch, but also because there are so many communities around the world who rely on sharks for food and to you to sell so that they can have the money to put shoes on their kids so their kids can go to shoot go to school and yeah you know, I, I want to see all of that continue and that's why I work that's why I'm you can tell I'm just sort of starting to ramble but that's why I'm passionate about the subject because sharks not just in their own right because of their importance to all of us we, we need them and we need to do what we can to keep that going but sharks are not like dolphins and whales you can't swim with them or at least with the ones that we are familiar with how can you sell to someone watching this in the future on youtube how can you sell the idea of loving sharks and think you know they're great what have you how can you sell that idea to someone who inherently you know has watched jaws who has basically formed their opinion on sharks from from that point on and has forwarded that on to future generations how do you change people's attitudes well we all know the story of Mowgli the jungle book and Shere Khan has a pretty bad rep from that but that doesn't stop people wanting to conserve tigers um, people can't go and wander around in the wild with a pride of lions but it doesn't stop people wanting to conserve lions um, you know that if you walk into the bush where there are lions around, you're, you're running a big risk. You know that if you go into the sea and swim, you're running actually quite a minor risk by comparison. And I think people do understand that. They understand that and it doesn't stop people wanting to ensure that the white shark is conserved for future generations or the bull shark, you know, which is possibly even more dangerous to people. You just learn to live with them. You learn to, um, to be in their environment in a safe way. Some of the most powerful advocates for white shark conservation I've met are survivors of shark encounters. There's an amazing guy in South Africa who lost a leg to a shark. And he is so, I just saw a dog walk past. Um, he is so um, committed to shark conservation, despite the fact that, you know, he's, he's lost a leg. And there are families who've lost um, children to sharks who say, well, just because of that, we don't want all sharks to be killed because he took a risk, he went into the sea. Um, in an area where we know the sharks and um, it, you know, he paid the ultimate price and it's, it's a tragedy. It's a tragedy for every individual and every family uh, who loses a member of the family or a friend. It's an awful thing to happen, but it doesn't take away the fact that uh, we need sharks for our future and we need them to maintain balance in the marine environment. Um, we need them for food if, if you know, we happen to live in a subsistence community by the sea. Um, they're important for culture. There are Polynesian islanders for whom sharks are really, really important and they know they're dangerous. Um, and they know that people will sometimes be eaten, but they're, they're of huge cultural importance. It, uh, I'm sort of losing my thread, David, but I hope that what I'm saying makes a bit of sense. Well, it makes total sense, because at the end of the day, you know, it's very, very terrible, you know, for the families of the victims of shark attacks. 
Um, but it also reminds us of our place in the cycle of things. We're not, you know, lords of everything. We are part of a, a natural sort of ecological system, which means that we are potentially prey, you know, simple as that. But what's fascinating, I mean, after saying what you're, you know, hearing what you're saying, I mean, I remember being in Sri Lanka and birding with a group and we saw some black finned, I think they're black tipped or black, black tip sharks um, in the, in the um, estuary we were watching. And they were quite small, about maybe four foot long. And a couple of people, tourists, walked past us and said, you know, what are you looking at? I said, we're looking at birds, but there's a couple of sharks down there. Sharks, sharks. And no, it can't be sharks here, because again, they have this vision of, you know, great white. But then to see the sharks, they were so fascinating. They stayed with us for an hour, you know, watching them. Mm. Um, and I think they are creatures that really kind of engender some kind of awe, really, aren't they? They, they People just can't help themselves but to, to watch. I mean, obviously, you know, especially if you're at a safe distance, but you can watch them. And they are fascinating, aren't they? Yes, they are. And, you know, they are everywhere, because, as I've said, many sharks are this big, they're, they're tiny. And I think if you go into the sea anywhere around the coast of the UK, you're probably not very far from a shark. You know, may only be this big, but it's not far away. You're not far from a ray, which is hidden somewhere in the sand. Um, it's just that we, we don't see them. They're hard to spot. Um, but yeah. they're there. I mean, I, there are places where I know if it's a good spring tide or if I went out snorkeling, I know exactly where to go to find shark eggs. Not, you know, maybe half an hour's drive from here. And that's just because that's the spot I know I can go and find them. I'm sure there are other places as well. Yeah. You said that there's around about 550 different species of shark, including the ones, you know, the deep sea ones and the ones that live on the, the floor of the sea near the shores. But how many of them do we need to worry about? Oh, five? Five species? Uh, white shark, bull shark. Um, I wouldn't go swimming in the open ocean with an oceanic white tip shark because they are very, very curious animals. And um, yeah, I just wouldn't want to do that. I, they're, they're one of my favorite sharks. They're just amazing, but you know, they're, they're dangerous. And um, I'm running out of examples now. Yeah, maybe some the hammerheads, but, but but there are very few sharks that will actually come up to you and maybe give you a nudge and a, a bite to see if you're edible. Most, most- What makes, sorry. Most sharks will I'll stay away think... from you. Most, most shark bites occur because um, the shark is threatened or frightened. But with the ones that can attack you, what makes them attack you? Is it just this innate? Because you always think of sharks as being, um, you know, hungry forever, eating whenever they can eat. And if they see an opportunity, they'll take it regardless of, you know, how, regardless of when they had the last meal. Mm. Is that right to assume regarding sharks? No, they're very picky eaters. And they are, they are specialists. There are very few sharks that are eat everything. Oh yeah, the tiger shark's one of those, actually. That's another one on my list. Tiger sharks will eat almost everything. You know, they'll eat sea, sea turtles, albatross, fish, um, all sorts of debris in the water. But um, most sharks are picky. And bear in mind, they don't have any hands or feet or anything to sort of go up and poke you and see whether you're edible. The only thing they have to investigate, apart from their amazing lateral lines and, and electronic senses, is, is the mouth, the teeth. Um, most shark attacks take place in fairly murky water. When the shark can't actually see what it is that's out there, it just knows there's something big. So bull shark attacks are often in murky water and the shark sneaks up and takes a bite. And the thing about the natural prey of sharks, sharks will attack a marine mammal like a seal. They'll take a bite and then they'll fall off. They'll wait and they'll wait and they'll wait until the animal has died and is safe to eat. Because these big items of prey like a, a sea lion can do a lot of damage to a shark. So you just want to do a sneak attack, bite and leave and wait 
until the animal is no longer a danger to you. Um, I'm sure everyone's seen um, photos of white sharks doing these incredible launches from deep water right out of the surface. Um, they do that um, for decoys, for example, uh, an outline being held behind, hauled behind a boat, but colleagues of mine in South Africa have seen them do the same thing for a cardboard box that's floating in the water. And of course, a cardboard box is of no use for lunch for a shark. They launch themselves at such a speed that they're committed before they realize that it's not edible and it's too late then. So, um, yeah, the seals, of course, have the problem that their mates aren't going to help them out of the water if they get bitten. But there are, you know, some shark encounters which are not fatal because if it's a, a swimmer or a surfer, people will help them out of the water. It's not a fatal bite. Um, provided they get medical attention. Yeah. You hear about sharks and their supernatural ability to actually detect um, people. And I've heard stories, I don't know if it's true or not, about the fact they can, they can sense blood from like, a, you know, 20 miles away or something. And also that women who are menstruating should not get into the, you know, to the sea. Is that, is that, is that true? Um, they certainly have acute sense of smell and um, they, they, they have various senses which they use one after the other. So if you've got a shark in the open ocean and it's looking for food, one of the first um, clues it may detect is scent. So it may detect um, oil. So if people are fishing for sharks, they'll use a sort of a chum, which is mostly sort of fish oil and guts and markets, the oil they're detecting, blood in the water, they'll detect that and they will follow, use a sinuous pattern to follow upstream till they find the source. And they can actually detect which nostril is receiving the strongest scent. So this is why they will do this sort of sinuous thing that they're, they're, they're tracking the strongest scent. So it's like, so sort of imagine you're using your ears, using your right ear, your left ear, to find out where the sound is coming from. So that's why you get this track. Once they get closer, they'll switch to sight. So many sharks have got very, very good eyesight. Um, not all of them, but many of them do. So they'll look, they'll switch to sight. But the, the um, secret sense, which is most extraordinary, is their electro sense. And they can, they actually have special organs all over their head and along the sides of their body, which can detect the tiny, tiny electric signals, which all living creatures give out when they're moving. So the muscle, muscle movements give out these tiny electric signals and they can detect those. And that is how a hammerhead shark, for example, can find prey that's actually buried under the sand. The whole of that front of the hammer has got huge concentrations of these electroreceptors on and it can actually chase down, you know, to find an object that's buried in the sand or find um, an electric cable, which is sending out signals in the sand. So is that why the hammerhead sh head is shaped the way it is? It's basically a shovel. It's, yeah, it's a sort of, it's like, um, like a metal detector, very broad metal detector. And it's got this it's sort of a whole array under the, the head of these receptors. But actually, that's probably not the only reason that the head's so broad. Having a broad head like that is, is really helpful for, for movement and for lift, because I, I mentioned sharks don't have swim bladders. So um, some species can just go and lie on the seabed and, and pump water over their gills using their mouths, but others have to move all the time. They can never stop moving um, or they will sink. And actually having this sort of hydrofoil probably is very helpful to give the hammerhead lift so that it doesn't sink to the bottom of the sea. And the other thing it's really helpful for, hammerheads like to eat stingrays. And with a nice big head like that, you can pin the animal down on the seabed while you're biting it. And many hammerheads are found with stingray barbs in and around their head. Yeah. Um, so they speaking, use them as well. Speaking of stingrays, I mean, that's how um, Steve Irwin and met his unfortunate end, which must, is that a rare event being Incredibly killed rare. by a stingray? Incredibly rare, yeah. 
very bad luck. Okay, um, so we talked about hammerheads because I'm, I'm fascinated by hammerheads. I didn't realise actually that they were uh, as dangerous as you said they were. I thought they were sort of fairly, not docile, but they wouldn't sort of bother people. Yeah, they're not one of the most, I mean, they have bitten people, but actually they've got a pretty small mouth, you know? So um, yeah, they, they, have, they have been implicated in bites, but I suspect that it wasn't that they were looking for a person to eat because they just don't eat that. That's not what they do. That's not what hammerheads eat. And is there a bit of an industry when it comes to shark watching? I noticed there was a section in the book about shark, wa shark watching. Is that akin to whale watching or do you actually do both? You're out watching whales and happen to see sharks? Um, I, think, I think it started off probably like that. Um, so one of the original <clears> whale uh, shark watching centers of the world was in South Africa, where they had a very important whale watching industry and they still do, the, um, the southern right whale is an amazing whale to watch in South Africa. But um, with time, as um, people discovered that white sharks could reliably be, be found, um, the shark watching industry in South Africa took, took off and it took off to such an extent it became even more valuable to the local economy than the whale watching, which is massive. So they are sort of separate because you need different um, different facilities, you know, you, you, and the regulations are also very different. So whale watching is very, very tightly controlled. Um, shark watching, not so much because it's more recent. You mentioned earlier about being in a cage and having a white, great white shark rattle your cage. What's that to, like? I'm not supposed to talk about that. That's not supposed to happen. Um, it was amazing. It was absolutely astonishing. You know, they, they can't get in. I, I, it was, I don't know, it was just having a bad hair day or something. It was just a bit cross and um, frustrated. So, so what you do in South Africa is um, the shark watchers get into a cage. Um, they don't sink it into deep water. You're actually standing there, water up to your chin with a mask and a snorkel on. And the guys at the top of the boat have got a, a big tuna head on a rope and they're throwing it into the water to encourage the sharks to come past the cage. And so you'll be there, not able to see very much. And then they'll shout, right, right. And you go underwater and you look to the right and you'll see a shark coming past. You know, and they just sort of glide past the cage and glide back. And uh, this particular one, which misbehaved, came right at the boat, you know, straight at us. And it didn't um, turn and go past us. It just kept going and went and rattled the cage which is not supposed to happen, um, but it was absolutely perfectly safe. It was just really cool. How did you feel though when that happened? Were you frightened or excited? No, no, and I was really, actually what was, I was so thrilled by it. I had both my kids with me and they weren't scared either, which was great. I mean, there was one person who in the cage a bit further on who did rather lose their nerve, but no, I mean, they can't get in, you know, they can't get at you and um you know it's an extra special special encounter and yeah. whether the shark was just a bit cross because it was tired of seeing these fish heads you know being taken away from it or whether it was just coming straight in and it met this cage of metal which of course throws off all of these electric fields which can actually be quite confusing for a shark and whether it just you know went and bit at the um, source of the electric fields without actually caring what was behind them. I don't know. But it was an, in, you know, it was a really short event and it was thrilling and amazing. Absolutely amazing. Yeah, I'd be worried that the shark might suddenly produce a pair of keys or some keys from its gills. <laughs> yes. Um, your book is incredible, by the way, guys. You need to, uh, I can't show you all of it because maybe I can if I do this, but it's a big tome. I noticed actually looking through it, that a lot of the sharks um, there's very little, little known about their behaviour, uh, very little, mm. which I, I suppose is quite reasonable to assume because they are underwater and, you know, how often do you get to watch and study things underwater for any prolonged period of time? But even so, it's, uh, I believe it's the first complete kind of shark guide in the world, is that right? 
Um, it's we we've produced them before, but this one has got more information and more species in it than any other. So it's okay, the most complete state of the so art, far, as far so. as we're concerned. Yeah, and so. um, yeah, it's it's uh, it was such fun to do. It really was, um, especially when it was over. I'm sure. <laughs> What is your favourite shark, by the way, Sarah? If you told me I was you were going to ask me that, and it's always a difficult one. Um, I think I will stick with a shark which occurs in many parts of, of the world, in temperate waters from Australia and New Zealand, South Africa, South America, Europe. And it's my first shark. It's the taupe shark. And despite the fact it's been in fisheries, oh, and North America too, it's been fished all over the world, it's important for food, it's important for fins, it's been called the liver oil shark, the soup fin shark, the um, all sorts of names. We know so little about it, and you've said, why don't we know more about the behaviour and what have you with these sharks? It's a shark we don't know nearly enough about, so if I was only to have one shark in my life, it would be the taupe shark. And if you could be anywhere in the world at this given moment, um, notwithstanding all the restrictions at the moment, um, where would you be? Um, oh, I would be back in Sabah in Borneo because I learned so much about sharks working there. There are still new species turning up. Um, the food is amazing. The people are lovely. Um, I think I'd go back to Sabah. Sounds great. So uh, Zoomers, just to let you know that coming up, we've got a couple of um, interviews coming up, but there's a few more yet to be advertised. But the ones up at the moment on the site include uh, this Wednesday coming the 7th, sorry, should I say the 27th of October, Ben Hoare, who is a writer and also the deputy editor of BBC World magazine. He'll be talking about his book, Wild Cities and all the wonderful creatures that can be found, not all because I'm all night, but you know, some of the wonderful creatures that can be found in various cities around the world. On Monday the 1st of November, we have uh, Amy Jane Beer, Dr. Amy Jane Beer back again, and she's written a book called A Tree A Day. So we'll be talking about trees. Uh, so that's on Monday the 1st of November, and on November the 15th, again, another Monday, we have a guy called John Dunn. I really love this guy, actually. He's a very interesting man. He's actually an economist um, who's become a naturalist, even though he's always been interested in nature. But he's written a book called The Glitter in the Green, and it's about a search for hummingbirds. And he's a really, really good writer. So we'll be talking with him then. So, uh, Sarah, um, really interesting evening tonight i mean again it's one of those nights where we've only just scratched the surface i've got so many more questions i'd like to ask and i'm sure some of the zoomers have too but we'll do that in q a but in the meantime i'd like to thank you very much for sparing your time tonight and also for being part of this i'm glad to have this on my shelf actually because when i saw this book as i said i thought wow this is really unusual and i want to learn more about sharks so thank you very much Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. I've really enjoyed it. Good, good. I'm glad. And Zoomers, um, again, thank you for being here um, and supporting In Conservation With. It's been three seasons now. It's great. Um, so um, I will leave you now and I'll, I'll hope that you, uh, you have a, a safe time. And uh, if you do watch any sharks, let us know. And until we meet again, Take care of yourselves and don't forget, keep looking up.